By now, you should be comfortable with common electronic components, such as the resistor and capacitor. Moreover, you should be aware of how these components affect things such as voltage or current in a DC circuit. But in this lab, we'll explore how the characteristics of these components change when alternating current or AC is utilized in a circuit. In addition, a new component called an inductor will be introduced with the SI unit of Henry. It is common practice to use the letter L to stand for an inductor, the letter C to stand for a capacitor, and the letter R to stand for a resistor. In the first procedure of this experiment, we will construct an RC circuit. Therefore, we will be using a resistor and a capacitor. We will start by setting the resistance of this decade resistor to 500 ohms, and we will experimentally measure the actual resistance with our DMM, recording this value as our resistance. Next, we will set our decade capacitor to 1 microfarad, and construct our circuit with the resistor and capacitor wired to the function generator. The function generator should be set to a sine wave with a frequency of 250 hertz. With our DMM set to measure AC voltage, we'll set the amplitude of the function generator such that the DMM measures 3 volts, but remember that this is an RMS value. It is also noteworthy that because this is an AC circuit and there is a phase shift involved, the sum of the voltage drops across the components will not add up to the supply RMS voltage. That being said, we'll measure the voltage across the decade resistor and then calculate the RMS current, impedance, reactance of the capacitor, as well as an experimental capacitance for the capacitor. Next, we'll change the frequency of the function generator to 500 Hz then use the DMM to set the supply voltage to 3 volts RMS again. We will then determine the new voltage across the decade resistor and perform the same calculations as before. You should notice that the experimental capacitance value is independent of the frequency and should be reasonably close to the theoretic value. For the next procedure, we will be building an RL circuit. To begin this process, we will change the resistance of the decade resistor to 40 ohms, and we will need to measure the resistance of one of our ghillie coils with our DMM, because the resistance will also be part of our circuit. Now we can construct a simple circuit by connecting our resistor, inductor, and function generator. Initiating the function generator, we will set the device to produce a sine wave with a frequency of 250 hertz. To set the amplitude, we will use the DMM to measure the RMS voltage, setting this value to 3 volts as before. Once more, the voltage across the decade resistor will be determined using the DMM. And then the RMS current, impedance, reactance of the inductor, and the inductance of the inductor can be calculated. We will then increase the frequency of the function generator to 500 hertz and we'll repeat the same process just as was done in the first procedure. Again, the inductance should be independent of frequency and an average value will be used in the next procedure. For the final procedure of this experiment, we will create an LC circuit, but we need to use an oscilloscope in order to better understand what is occurring in the circuit. Once the device has initiated we will connect a BNC to banana cable to the first channel and check to make sure that the attenuation factor is set to 1x on the oscilloscope. We will set the coupling to DC and then connect the ghillie coil that we did not use in the previous procedure to the oscilloscope using the banana probe cables. We will also connect the, this ghillie coil to the function generator using banana cables. The function generator should be set to produce a 500 hertz square wave this time. Next, we'll connect the same ghillie coil that we used in the previous procedure to the second channel of the oscilloscope using another BNC to banana cable. We'll also connect in parallel to this ghillie coil our decade capacitor box. The capacitor should be set to 0.01 microfarads. And the second channel the oscilloscope should also be set to 1x attenuation and DC coupling. Now, when the ghillie coils are placed coaxially to each other, 
or in such a manner as the centers of the coils are aligned. A damped oscillation should be visible on the second channel of the oscilloscope. Keep in mind that the first channel of the oscilloscope is simply showing what the function generator is sending through the first gilly coil, that is the one that was not used in the prior procedure. While the second channel of the oscilloscope is only connected to the gilly coil used in the second procedure and a capacitor. Assuming that both of these components began uh, discharged, then it may be assumed that this half of the circuit includes no explicit power supply. Finally, take a look at what happens when the gilly coils are moved farther apart. So what is going on here? Essentially, the first gilly coil that is connected to the function generator is transmitting a modulated RF signal through the air to the second gilly coil. When the square wave goes high, current is passed through the wire coil and an electromagnetic field is produced. This increasing magnetic field induces a current in the second gilly coil, and this current is able to briefly charge the capacitor. However, in mere moments the magnetic field dissipates and the capacitor discharges into the inductor, creating another magnetic field. In ideal circumstances, this process would cycle endlessly, because once charged, an LC circuit should in theory continue to oscillate between charging the capacitor and the inductor. But because there is a small resistance in the wires of the inductor, the oscillations decrease over time, producing the damped or decaying signal. That being said, notice that when the square wave goes low, there is no current flowing through the first gilly coil. The LC portion of the circuit continues to oscillate without any outside power source. To finish this experiment, we will simply use the cursors on the oscilloscope to measure the period of the damped oscillations, then determine the inductance of the gilly coil. If the correct coil was used in the LC portion of the circuit, then this experimental inductance should be similar to the inductance calculated in the previous procedure.